Siemens. But it's important to recognize that Siemens is one of the great technology companies in the world. Uh, and in Washington, there's a lot of discussion about policy uh, in energy. But if you're not going to discuss technology, markets, uh, regulation, really capital formation, these serious aspects, you can't have a serious conversation about energy policy. And um, uh, uh, Siemens is a company which has been very active um, all over the world. Um, it has a market capitalization in excess of $100 billion. Um, it's uh, been a leader um, in the energy space, but in a number of other spaces as well, uh, including uh, health care, uh, industrial sector and infrastructure and city sector. So it is a it is a great global company. It's also a great American company. It has over 60,000 employees in the United States. So it's a very, very substantial company. And Joe Kaiser knows this company and this business very well. He's been with the company for um, uh, uh, over 30 years. Um, and he ran strategy. He was chief financial officer. He spent six years in California in San Jose and their operations there from 1994 to 2000. So he has, he runs, this is a, a, a global executive who runs a global company in some of the most advanced technology in the world. And so for CSIS, we couldn't be more pleased to have him here. And so I will turn it over to our ever dynamic Frank Verastro. And Joe, uh, I know you have some words. Welcome. Thank you. Do you, want to, you can speak here. Right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for these very nice introductions. I don't have don't have to have that too often. So I'll be <laughs> happy to come back on this one. And I, it's true. I uh, lived in the United States for six years, 1994 till uh, 2000, in the middle of the Silicon Valley, and. Uh, it was a really great experience. That was, was the time when the bubble was building up. No one knew it was a bubble, but then eventually, when everyone knew about it, it was too late. And um, it was a great place to be at. And since then, I'm a big 49er fan. <laughs> I know they're having a mixed season this time, but uh, people said when I was in the Silicon Valley, you know, every company which, which builds a new headquarter, you better sell the stock. And uh, maybe this is also true in sports. So I don't know. We'll see how it's going to go. Don't know about the Redskins. <laughs> <laughs> Might want to stay away from that topic. But still. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, there, is, uh, there are even more important matters than sports. And this is obviously also about energy, infrastructure, and how to develop an economy going forward. And this is something, this is something which our company has been doing, trying, uh, for more than 167 years. Energy, infrastructure, industrial automation, as well as healthcare. And if it goes to energy, which is kind of the beginning of everything, if an economy starts existing, developing, this is about energy. That's the first thing which any country, any society needs to have. And even, you know, this great, mystic, wonderful Silicon Valley, it gets pretty dark at night if there is no energy. It's always important if you talk about digitalization, software, and everything else. It is about energy, and this is where everything starts. And I just do believe that this is a very important moment in the evolution of global economy because we do see those tectonic shifts if it comes to energy across the world. And that's something I really would like to talk about today. That will give you... I'll give you a sense of what the electrification company in the world, the electrification company in the world, Siemens, sees in terms of energy dynamics and complexity and how we keep up with them. And you know, Siemens uh, kind of has its headquarter in Germany. And if it comes to energy policy in Germany, there's a lot to talk about and there's a lot to learn from. And in that process, I'll kind of really extend a more global perspective on the energy paid here in the United States. And if it goes to Siemens, this is really global. In 1847, Siemens was founded in Berlin at a garage, so the typical thing where you found a company becomes successful. And today, we operate in 212 countries in the world. 
12 and 12 countries in the world with more than 350,000 employees and more than 60,000 people in the United States. When I was uh, in the Silicon Valley, uh, already representing Siemens, and I introduced myself and said, well, I'm, I'm broke for Siemens. And I said, okay. And you could tell that no one had a clue about what this company was all about. And someone, people sometimes told me, oh, you are that big Mathis factory? <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> actually, not really. Uh, not really, but, but you know, we do this and this and this. And said, oh, 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 well, I know that one. So sometimes it's all about brand. But then again, if we talk B2B, engineers to engineers, experts to experts, you know, our brand is very well known all across the world. And uh, if I have to explain, you know, what my company is all about, I used to say we are born in Germany, we have been raised in Europe, but now we are home in the global world. And you really are. And this depth of global experience, particularly, but of course not limited to the energy sector, has taught us that the global economy can really change at incredible speed and have significant impact if the energy agenda is not going to be set right. It's not going to be set right. The international energy agencies predict that more than half of the global increase of energy is being needed to fuel tomorrow's world. And we should never forget if we complain about falling oil prices or things like that, energy is an important matter of developing a global society. But the question then obviously is, the question really is, how do we generate this more energy? How do we generate it more efficiently? How do we generate it more sustainably? And last but not least, how do we generate it more affordably? More affordably. And all three need to come together at one point. And in Germany, where Siemens is headquartered and where I'm from, has been tackling that question for years. And the outcome was the so-called German Energiewende, the transition of energy, which basically started by with eliminating, if, with eliminating the nuclear program. By 2022, we are going to be out of nuclear. That's what the plan is for today. And the plan was that we're going to shift to renewable energy, solar and wind. And this plan is really ambitious because we do want to have about 40 to 45 percent of our energy being generated by renewable energy. And that's quite an admirable goal, but also a goal that has now been Germany fighting for a very lonely revolution. As high natural gas prices in Germany lead to an increase in coal imports since this energy transition began. And as a result, and as a result, a country that had all the ingredients to be a leader in the energy transition is finding now itself left with a lot of, with a massive issue on how to finance this energy going forward. It's a very, very costly bill. The energy, the renewable energy being produced in Germany in 2013 was reimbursed with 23 billion euro cost. The price for that energy being produced as renewables at the Leipzig Energy Exchange was 3 billion. So 20 billion of subsidies per year guaranteed for 20 years. Makes it 400 billion euro subsidy for an industrial country like no one else in the world. Situation today, as we can see it from obviously far away, is that the United States situation is much different indeed. There is no country, there is no country in the world which has a greater opportunity for affordable, reliable and sustainable energy generation than the United States. There is no one in the world which has all that ingredients for, for that what we can do. Now if I look at the United States, the way energy can be produced, at what cost, at what price, this is going to be fostering the next revolution of, of industrialization in this country. That's what it's going to do. And if you only get 50% right of what you can do, 
this is the most prosperous, the most uh, effective economy in the world. How come? How come? As I said, energy is important, and it's the start of everything else. And this energy agenda, if you really pull it through, the cheap gas, the industrial conditions, they will trigger a lot of companies to come to this country and build the next manufacturing. And the, agenda, the energy agenda, the reindustrialization of this country will make sure that there's a lot of people here in this country who not only love German cars, but also can afford them again. <laughs> <laughs> so where do you think, where do you think those German cars are being built? In Stuttgart, or in Munich, or in Wolfsburg? No, they're going to be built in this country. And this is what the Industrial Revolution in this country is going to be all about. This is not bringing jobs back from Mexico or China into the United States. It's about building on the opportunity this country can offer with reliable, affordable, and sustainable energy. That's the baseline. And the next topic, obviously, is about infrastructure. That's very important. That has been the German issue all along with the energy agenda. They have had their opportunities, but there was a lack of infrastructure because power today still needs to be transported from place A to place B. There is no wireless transport of power. It's got to be transported from place A to place B. And uh, from what I hear, you know, it's about high noon today, there will be a vote about the Keystone Pipeline. This is also about infrastructure. This is about transporting energy to the place where it's needed. We like it a lot, of course, because we've been supporting it out of those reasons that infrastructure matters to transport energy from place A to place B. We have about a 350 million order ticket in there, so we really like it, but not because of our economic advantage. We believe energy and infrastructure needs to come together to create an industrial footprint for this country to make it even better and even stronger as it is today already. There is a huge potential uh, out of those areas and the United States, ladies and gentlemen, is once again the place to be. Not just because of those beautiful areas from Alaska to Hawaii to Florida and everywhere else, it is the place to be. Because an economy to prosper needs a good legal system stable and reliable economic system, but that's energy and infrastructure, and everything else will come. It's almost like, you know, this movie, build it, and he will come. And to say it in a different way, build the infrastructure, and they will come, because everyone wants to take advantage of those areas and those things you have here in the States. And there is actually a very interesting uh, German proverb and that proverb says, aus einem Stein ist es schwer, Öl zu pressen. So the rough translation says, uh, you can't squeeze oil out of a stone. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. And it seems that some proverbs weren't made to last. <laughs> and German companies are surely taking notice. And in 2014 alone, German investments in the United States will be added up to 65 billion US dollars. 65 billion alone in 2014. So you can definitely see, you know, it's worthwhile going that extra mile. It's worthwhile providing energy infrastructure at an affordable, sustainable, and reliable base. This is everything what it takes to be successful. And that's why we are here, not just since 2014, but more than 100 years in this country, and we are continuing to invest in this economy. We just have uh, announced that we are going to acquire Bresorant, which uh, I believe is the premium brand for oil and gas equipment based in Houston, Texas. And this is gearing towards fortifying our business in North America. And we have been relocating our Siemens Energy headquarters to Houston. It's the first time in Siemens history, after 167 years, that a German company-based managing board member is outside Germany. It's in Houston. And that's where you better be. If you are going oil and gas, 
If you're going reindustrialization, this is the place to be. And sometimes I'm being asked, why did you do that? Why did you do that? And uh, even from high officials in, in my government, who sometimes think this is, you know, I let them down because I moved that headquarter out. This is not about letting anyone down in policy or in government. This is about going where our customers are. This is about going where the innovation happens. How should I convince my customers that we have the world's largest and most efficient gas turbine if my own country doesn't buy it, doesn't use it? How can I be innovative if the customers I have in Germany, the utilities, which got wiped out in their business model, have other things to worry about than innovation? So I could go to Florida Light and Power. I go to utilities here because they are innovative. They are good in what they do. A company can only be as innovative as their customers are. So this is about innovation, it is about demand, and those are the key factors for success. And that's what we do, what we've got to do, because I have more to lose than an election. <laughs> I have more to lose than an election. If you look at uh, the natural gas prices here in the country, you know, just hitting the three dollar line, if I'm uh, informed correctly, that's a massive opportunity. It is a massive opportunity. The price of wind is at an all-time low, down 35 percent. The cost of solar is down 60 percent in 2011, and the internal forecasts show that um, energy demand and decentralized energy is going to double uh, in the next uh, years till up to 2030. And that distributed energy is going to be making up one third, one third of the, United States, of the United States economy. And that is really, really important. And you know, if you talk about Keystone, if you talk about pipelines, if you talk about environmental and safety concerns, I do appreciate that those, those things do pose challenges to the United States. And I'm not here that didn't come to weigh in on those debates. This is a decision and a debate the American people have to make. And we will be prepared for any outcome as a company. But I do believe, I really do believe that infrastructure, transporting energy, making good conditions available for anyone in the industry here in this country is a massive enabler for the generations to come to be very, very successful. And that's, I believe, what is really important. And we can not only help in infrastructure and energy, we can also help to make that infrastructure and energy much more efficient. And this is about automation. And this is about what the digital age will bring in a modern industry. Not in media, not in consumer, but in the industrial world. And this uh, new industrial revolution is called Industry 4.0. That's how we call it. In Germany, people call it Internet of Things. We call it Industry 4.0. This is about a leaner, a more efficient, and a software-driven high-tech production. And that will transform the industry landscape also in power. And that's why we are investing in the United States and we continue to invest also in the years to come. We have invested 25 billion, 25 billion US dollars in the United States in the last uh, 15 years. And this is only the beginning. This is only the beginning. Because we can automate and we can help in almost all parts of the value chain if it comes to energy infrastructure or, or, or uh, industrial automation. And our experience in innovation lie in everything that happens after the oil or the natural gas is extracted. How it's transported, how it's being converted to liquefied natural gas, and how it's going to, connect it, to be connected across the supply chain of this world. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, this is what we can do. This is where Siemens can and will have an impact on the future of this industry and the future of this country. We do believe, I do believe, that the United States energy transformation is a once in a lifetime moment. It is a once in a lifetime moment. And I really do invite every one of you, come over and see how we did it in Germany and do exactly the opposite. <laughs> it was not the intent 
which went wrong. It was the execution which went wrong. The intent to step out of nuclear energy, I believe is the right thing to do. This is not about the residual risk that some can blow up. I don't mean that. There is no tsunami in the River Rhine. <laughs> there is no earthquake uh, somewhere else in Germany. That's fine. It's not a residual risk, but it is a moral obligation for the, a human modern civilization that we do not leave 230, 230 generations behind with the nuclear waste, which there is nowhere to go. That's the moral issue. That's the moral hazard on nuclear energy. Because we've got no clue. We've got no idea and no solution how to store the nuclear waste for the next 23,000 years. At least not store it safely. So that's the triggering event why I believe a human society has an obligation not to leave 23,000 years, 23, years waste behind for the generations to come. So that was okay. And I truly do support that. But the way to do it needs to be different in an industrialized, high-tech economy, which is the, highly, the most highly industrialized country in the world. And that was wrong, and that's what we need to fix. And I really do, I really do urge you, don't go down that path. It could be devastating for the single biggest economy in the world, for the proudest country in the world, which is only the beginning for an even better world to come. With that, I thank you very much. And I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Excellent, Joe. Thank you so much. So let me say just for starters that, that I actually had the opportunity to, to meet and see Joe in operation um, down at the SARA conference this past March. And I was so taken with him because in addition to his ability to be a CEO and, and focus on the details of business operations, he could also step back and talk about what this means in a global uh, climate, a changing atmosphere with technology and geopolitics uh, and finances moving around so quickly. And he had the ability and the candor to move between those two worlds. And I thought it would be a great opportunity to actually bring him here and, and you did not disappoint. Um, increasingly, we need in Washington to see the perspective of other folks uh, from outside of Washington. And with all the discussions that we're having with the EU and talking about sanctions as the global marketplace, as we look at this energy revolution, to keep in mind that this is an evolution, it's an iteration of different changes that we've seen in the energy market, but it's substantial and it's big and it's different and we need to take advantage of the opportunity at the same time that we manage economic performance and ec environmental stewardship and safety. And you touched on all those points. So that was absolutely terrific. Um, for starters, I think I'm gonna borrow a, a bit from Robin's introduction. So the fact that you're a truly global company, right? You're in 200 countries, you're in the Middle East, Asia, Latin America, obviously Germany and Europe, and now in the United States, how do you plan and see the differences where you want your investment to go? You talked about governance in a legal system. You talked about low-cost energy. But these are big-ticket bets that you have to make on a daily basis. So how do you go about that process? Well, there are big-ticket bets to make because, obviously, in those areas you're at, like energy and infrastructure, it takes a long time. And I just, just came in from Boston last night. But I did have investors conferences. There are sales side people talking about, you know, Siemens. They give a lot of unasked advices <laughs> how I should run the company. <laughs> and they said, how can you possibly, you know, now acquire a restaurant when oil prices go down and the cycle of oil and gas is going to come to an end? And I said, look, I can <laughs> because I'm not in for a quarter. I'm in for the next generation of this company. And I did take that job last year, just about a year ago, not because of money, not because of being a powerful CEO with some, you know, some, some power which is nothing but uh, you know, given for a period of time. It was about that I want this company to be a better company for the next generation. Because this is what ownership culture is all about. That's what we owe our next generation. Every owner of a company, every owner of a, of a small business who have gotten that business from his or her father has a very natural, very natural 
desire to give it away in a better shape to the next generation. And that's what we own to our people, to our employees, that's what we own to our country. That's just what makes a difference in the end. And I call it ownership culture. That's what I want my company to be. Act as if that was your own company. And if I do it differently, I said, please act as if that was your own country. And then all of a sudden politics moves to states, men, and states, women. Because politics is about majority of votes for a limited period of time. And states, men, and states, women do the right thing for their country even though they lose the job. Everything, everything, which made Germany the most powerful country in Europe for the last 10 years, is being based on Chancellor Schroeder's agenda 2010. He lost the job. He didn't get re-elected, but he did the right things. And I tell you something. In 10 or 20 years from now, when the history books are being written about who were great leaders in Germany, there's not going to be something in there how often people have got re-elected. It's in there what people did for their country. And that's why this is so important, that you seek the dialogue together, you know, government, industry, leaders of companies to make their country and the society work. And that's why we go out and talk. And sometimes people say, look, you know, why don't you just take care of your company rather than do big debates and speeches in, in Washington, which you better go home and take care of your, you know, of your business. But then who needs to let people know if not the ones who go around all, all places, as you mentioned, Middle East and elsewhere. And we have been investing in this country here in the United States because we believe this is the place to be for the next generations. There is no such thing out there as the biggest economy in the world, right? The <clears throat> people who spend money privately and publicly and people who've got technology and have a very stable political system with hardly any geopolitical impact on the country. And if sometimes, you know, boardrooms talk about strategy, CEOs lay out their big strategy about things, it's very often forgotten that there is also geopolitical aspects which play a role in strategy. We have to put your resources to work. And I'd rather have my 10 billion euro or, or US dollars you know, spend on acquisitions and on businesses in a country which is safe, which knows how to defend itself, which is inherently an innovative country. And innovation is not always about technology. Of course it is about technology. But innovation is also about the ability to stand up if you've fallen down. Stand up if you've fallen down. Try it again. Better this time. Move on. And to, you know, in Europe today, or Germany, in Europe, anywhere, that the greatest hit is the Silicon Valley. People heard about digitalization, you know, Internet of Things, uh, Google and Facebook and what have you. And everyone wants to go to Silicon Valley. So they take a flight to San Francisco, drive down 101 South, which is not exactly nice. <laughs> take a U-turn in San Jose, and go up 280 and fly home. And they said, I've, been, I've seen the Silicon Valley. And it's all great. That we got to do the same thing in Germany, or in France, or in Switzerland, or elsewhere. Well, if they should have taken you know, Highway 1 up north. It would be much nicer than 280. <laughs> but still, but still, they have seen nothing except that they try to copy something which you can't copy. It's not about copying the Silicon Valley. It's about understanding it. And then, you know, we need to move and see what does it take. In Germany, you know, if you, if you found a business and you fail, you need to go to the church, you're going to be taken out of business for a lifetime, your reputation is completely gone, don't even show up in the, in the, at the football game anymore because people are that guy, <laughs> that guy went bankrupt. You know, and... You mean it's uh, that guy, by the way. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> that guy, someone else went bankrupt and it's over. So innovation is a cultural thing, not just technology. It's about letting people fail in the best interest of what they've been trying to do and learn from it and move on. So there's a lot of stuff which needs to be considered and that's about the United States. It's about culture, 
standing up if you have fallen down and try better again. And uh, people, you know, talk a lot about this industrial revolution, industry 4.0, Internet of Things. And everyone says, well, it's got to be Germany because Germany has an industrial base and it's all cool and the BMWs and the folk and the Mercedes and, and what have you and Siemens, of course, and others. And, you know, if I look who's got the biggest potential to revolutionize the industrial world, it's the United States. It's the United States. Not because of uh, a high industrial base, which in a way is. It is about something else. It's about software. It is about semiconductor. It is about the reindustrialization, which is being triggered by energy and infrastructure buildup. And if you folks get that all together, this is a recipe which no one else has in the whole world. No one has. Because digitalization is about software and about semiconductors, first and foremost, and it's ap applying them to the industrial world. That's what it is. Nothing more and nothing less. It is about the internet, and the internet is not a, a myth. And the internet is very simple. The internet is very, very simple. And this is, the internet does something in the Industrial Revolution, in this Industry 4.0, which it has done since the beginning. It cuts out the weak points, the weak elements of the value chain. Elements of the value chain which do not add any value to anything are being cut out. That's what the internet is all about because it makes business more efficient. And this is also going to be applied to energy and infrastructure. So as I said earlier, if you folks only get 50% right of what you can do, this really is the country, you know, which uh, will show the way on industrialization, infrastructure, and energy. But then uh, make sure that the right decisions are being made. So for us, we've gone from a period, the last 40 years in this country, uh, we had a, a notion of scarcity. Energy was a liability for us. The laws that we enacted in the 70s, um, Certainly, I, I'm not sure that they need a major overhaul or throw the baby out with the bathwater, but they need to be revisited. Uh, everything from exports to Jones Act to taxation and incentives. We're also running into, because of the scale and the scope of this revolution, these above ground issues that you talked to. So um, reliability, public attitudes, uh, upstairs we were talking about them. When you, when you discuss electricity to a lot of consumers, they want to buy the wall that has the outlets because that's where they get their electricity from, right? That works when they plug in. But there's so much more than that that goes on behind the scenes. And you were talking about the football game, the Monday night football game um, that the Steelers just played in, and, and the notion that the power outage, what the impact of that means, and it brings it home, and how reliable it is. And so how do you continue to service? You've got the economics right, and you've got the business plan right, but if the infrastructure isn't put in place and maintained, and the policy is not right, you don't get the outcome. You get these suboptimal outcomes. That's very true. That's why I was uh, going on and on about energy and infrastructure being tied together. I mean, even the German energy agenda, after all, with all the subsidy and, and, and things like that, you know, its biggest issue today is that they don't bring the energy sources together mm -hmm. because of a lack of the grid. Because, I mean, obviously, you know, Germany is not much bigger than Ohio in terms of square you know, square miles, but then again, you know, in the north we have wind, in the south there is solar. People, many people in Germany say it makes as much sense to do solar energy in Germany like growing pineapples in Alaska, <laughs> which is a certain truth to it. I'm not against solar, <laughs> but uh, you need to have a lot of sun in order to be somehow, somehow uh, meaningful in, in energy. But then again, we've got it now, right? And it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to complain and complain and complain. We need to find solutions right. to it. And the solution is we need to connect the dots. We need to connect the wind energy in the north, you know, with the, the solar energy in the south, because just rumors has it that if the sun doesn't shine, there's a lot of wind. <laughs> right? And if, you know, the sun shines, usually and the weather is nice, then obviously the wind is somewhat limited. So we need to bring that together. And the issue in Germany, too, is that we do not have a, a natural correlation between supply and demand, which is different in other countries. 
if you go to in the south, you know, when, when the sun shines and it gets really hot, well, what do you need? Well, you need aircon, right? So you have a natural correlation between supply and demand because the sun, you know, makes the climate hot, so you need to, you need to cool the air, and you have a natural correlation. Right. So it always depends. I'm not against solar, please don't get me wrong. I'm not against wind, absolutely not. I'm not against renewable energy. All I'm saying is we need to connect the dots together so that, make, that it makes sense. So it's about infrastructure, you know, there is supply and there's infrastructure. And the more we go into renewables, the more we move from monosourcing of energy to multi-sourcing of energy. So what do I mean? Monosourcing is this, you know, this big, huge power plant, 1100 megawatts or 1500 megawatts. Then you have got this, this thick of wires to go out from the power station to a substation and then the energy gets distributed, right? to your house, to the curb, to, to industrial applications. That was the old world. In a new world with more and more renewable energies and the freedom of decentralized energy, you've got multi-sourcing. You've got power from solar, you've got power from wind, you've got power from biomass, you've got power from nuclear energy, and everything goes into the grid. You know, but solar only if the sun is shining, wind only if the wind is blowing. So someone needs to manage that grid. Because if everything goes in at the same time, it makes boom, and there is no football game because there is no power. So that's why this is so important, to connect the dots between energy um, generation and distribution. It's very important. If you have only one right, you know, not the other, it doesn't do any good. So I guess that's why it's so important to have a, if you talk energy policy in a country, it's also about how to bring it from the, the source to where demand, you know, happens. Very important. And everything else, you know, will fall in place over time. So we have a big infrastructure project going on here at CSIS, and we call it delivering the goods because you can't get yeah. the resources to the places you need it without that middle piece. I'm going to pick up on two things you said. So one is that you're into automation and digitalization. Uh, standardization as you start moving to multiple fuels and integrating them into a system is really important. Right. But also finding fuel sources that can be peak and base load, like natural gas is a perfect fuel. So can it you is. talk a little bit about the, the benefits of natural gas and, and why when in, in Houston, for example, you talked about how Siemens was going to invest 9 billion euros in the United States and by God, you've done it. I said that, right? Yeah, you did say that. So it, uh, <laughs> okay, fine, you said that. Well, uh, sometimes, and you, you followed through, more important. Sometimes you even deliver, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I remember I, I said, look, you know, this is the place to be and, and we will show. And then someone was asking me, what do you mean? I said, we are going to invest about 9 billion in the next 12 yeah. to 15 months. And I, I, it was funny when I went to the, to the audience, to the big room where I did the speech, I went by the restaurant and I said, you've got to be the 9 billion <laughs> <laughs> at the time because it is a real premium brand. And the way to go into the, the unconventional oil and gas was always important to us. Not because we go into the drilling and the fracking and and, and pumping and that because this is about electrifi electrifying okay. the oil and gas industry. Today we have a lot of hydraulics technologies mm -hmm. and things like that. And at some point in time, they're not going to be efficient anymore and we need to electrify, you know, the sub secret and this type of stuff. And that's why we did it. And that's why we believe this has been a very, very good acquisition in the long term. As I said, we are not here for the quarter or the year. And uh, I mean, look, uh, in the United States, all the roads lead to gas. Gas is clean, it's very reliable, it's here, yeah. it's here, <laughs> far away from any geopolitical crisis, and it will stay here. And it can be exported or not. You know, this is a decision, uh, you know, the United States people can make at any given point in time, they can change it if they deem necessary. And, uh, and that's why we have been investing into, into the natural gas here. I don't know where that's coming from, but okay. See if it comes closer. <laughs> <laughs> it's stopped. It's stopped now. Yeah. So, um, look, I mean, natural gas is clean. It's reliable and uh, it can be changed the world, really because it's all over the place. And here's the technology to make some meaningful out of it. 
Well, and I think one of your comments about how you used to have a sales force here that actually sold things, but now you've moved to manufacturing processes close to the source and what advantage that means to... That's, a, that's always something uh, I believe uh, one needs to consider. I mean, if you, if you produce chocolate bars, yeah. well, then it doesn't really matter where you produce them. You, you know, you do a nice marketing thing and a few ads and then you sell Milka or, or something or whatever, or Hirschley, and then that's it. No one cares where those chocolate bars being made. If you go into businesses like energy or infrastructure, even healthcare, you know, you go, you go with societal matters, mm -hmm. semi-public type of taxpayer sort of money. So you better also do something to the society which you want to make money from. Uh, and that's why, why manufacturing, engineering needs to be localized. In the old days, it was about saying, well, we build a manufacturing plant, and then that's it. This was the old world of localizing. Today's world of localizing is manufacturing plant is clear, but you also do engineering, you know, local R&D. That's today's world. Tomorrow's world is also localizing about decision making. It's very important. There's got to be a local decision maker. You've got the CEO right in the front row, which I expect him to be, right? Eric Spiegel, our CEO here in the United States, he's got to have decision power. If he goes to Rex or anyone, you know, in oil and gas, he needs to say, okay, deal, handshake. It's not about 5,000 pages of legal documents. It's about say, you and I go do something together. And if you don't have this, you're not meeting the CEOs of your customers. You meet the purchasing people. And that's the last place you want to be at. <laughs> so that's why localizing you know, yeah. of decision power is so important, and we continue to do that. We've got 60,000 people. We continue to build jobs here in the States and you bring technology to where we are good at. And that's what we're going to do. And I, you know, honestly, I do believe a, a, a company which does not provide value to society shouldn't exist. But I truly, truly do believe that. If you don't provide value to society, you shouldn't exist as a company. Because what for? Yeah. And leave it better Same than the way you found it. What for? Banking yeah. What for? Uh, and that's uh, very important. And if you want to provide value to society, you better be where society is. And of course, we are not. You know, only, uh, we are not in for for non-profit. That's a, that's a fact. But it's about giving and taking, and that's why we are here. That's why we continue to be here. That's why we continue to build up our resources in this beautiful country. Thanks. I want to raise the discussion uh, like thirty thousand foot level. So you're a, a advocate of global trade and of free trade agreements like TTIP. Can you talk about why that's so important in bridging the gap between, between continents and countries? It goes back a little bit to what you said about globalization. Globalization, in essence, is about redistribution of wealth, mostly between you know, developed economies to developing economies. That's what globalization is about, right? It's like you have a, a bottle here which is full, but I've got a bottle here which is empty. And there is a connector in between. And that connector there is, you know, there is a, a, a plug. And globalization means you remove this plug. And then the full bottle becomes half, and the empty bottle becomes also half. That's the redistribution of wealth by globalization. So someone wins and someone loses. And the question is, what do the losers do? to prevent that from happening. What do the losers do to fill it up again? The developed economies are the losers, per definition, right? So what is it that we can fill it up with? That's about innovation and global trade. You know, share what we are, what we are good at. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need to have, you know, a global free trade zone. And look what we can do together in the developed world, you know, to help the developing world to be successful without us losing our, you know, our life standards, our living standards. And that's why we need to work together in those areas. And this is not about the United States and Europe against China. No, absolutely not. This is about having a, forming a union which provides safe, secure economic trade. Because the evil is elsewhere. 
those are the ones who really do not want to like to live in peace and offer freedom to their society. So if I, you know, being asked about TTIP a lot in, in Europe, say, well, you know, how can we do that? The United States gets so powerful, not just as a military unit, but also as an economic unit, with shale gas and everything, and this and that, and Googles and what have you. So how can we potentially, you know, be a, a, a partner which is on, you know, the same footage? And I said, look, uh, we just need to be good. That's all. And, uh, and it's, you know, <laughs> Without the United States, there would not be a unified Germany. We just happened to have the 25th year anniversary of the fall of the wall in Berlin next, last weekend. Yeah. Saturday, Sunday, I was there. And, uh, you know, it was 25 years ago. I, unfortunately, I was in Malaysia at the time working, you know, for the company. And if you see all that, it was, would not have been possible without the United States. France? <laughs> United, UK, UK. Do you think those two countries wanted to have a stronger Germany? Maybe, maybe not. But the difference was the United States. That was the difference. And this is something also to think about if you talk about you know, trade and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the safe economic environment. So the TTIP is much more about trade. It is about you know, creating an economic zone of people and societies which share the same values and share the same need to be successful by our innovation. And that's why I believe this is a real good thing. Not just whether it's, you know, chicken not being, you know, enriched uh, 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 with chloride or not. Who the hell cares? <laughs> you know, this is about something else, something much bigger. And if you see how the world develops, you know, there are 40, there are 40 geopolitical crises being named today by the United Nations, four zero. Yeah. So someone needs to do something about it and form you know, a unified and a safe place to do business and to do trade. And that's what Europe and the United States would be all about if combined together mm -hmm. into, such a, into, into such a unit. I guess that's what really matters. So is, is that the way this world is heading, that, that where you've got uh, international good actors, bad actors, different groups, emerging economies, new players, old players in new roles, when you look at our institutions, a lot of which are post-World War II, they don't include a lot of the new players that are coming into the force. So is it, is it bilateral and multilateral trade agreements and other alliances that are going to keep that, that stitching of the, the world together? Um, I think so. I, I think that, um, that you know, nations need to become stronger by working together to basically defeat, defend and defeat the ones who are, don't want to play by the rules, right? I mean, sanctions is one thing, and it's very important. It's very important. But then if you have an economic power formed, you know, this will be the regulation uh, to deal with all the others. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I think this is much more than just trading a little bit without, without taxes and, and, uh, and income. Uh, and income duties, it's more about you know, creating a powerful economic world which shares the same rules uh, and values uh, to go after the ones who don't want to play by it. Okay. Uh, so I, I would believe this is another way above and beyond military power to help the world to become a better world. Because if you, if you see those geopolitical crises or some of them developing, think about, for example, the whole topic of the radical Islamic State which we see happening in Syria and, and, and Iraq. I'm not sure whether the Western world is really prepared with its usual way of going after things. Right, this is asymmetric. In the future. Uh, so we need to form something different. It is also about economic power, mm -hmm. you know, which is much more efficient, I, I guess, than having a few, you know, um, a few aircraft carriers or, 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 or uh, or, or jets to be sent and, and do a few things and then you fly back home and then what? Right. Yeah, it forms again and, uh, and so that's why I believe we need to also think about what will the modern, what the modern, <laughs> the, the future way of, of crisis will be looking like and how different. can we defend it? Is that still up with troops, you know, and spent blood? I don't know. And why always the United States, honestly? 
I mean, it's, it's, it's great and, you know, it's, and it's, uh, it's great and, and good enough that, you know, that you, your country, you know, makes this difference in the world. But the question is, can you always do that? You've got a lot on your plate, too. Yes. And so the question is, really, shouldn't there be a different power, economic power, you know, which helps the others understand that without joining the rules, they're going to be stuck. And they're without, behind. Yeah, they have a problem. Okay. They're going to be economically isolated. You talked a lot about sustainability and corporate responsibility and leaving the world the, a better than you found it. So when you look at the, the beginnings of, of shapings for Paris in 2015 and the climate announcement between the United States and China, how do you view that from Europe's perspective? Well, if, uh, if it worked, it would be a big step forward. Okay. As far as I understand, there is a 20% in China, includes also nuclear power, mm -hmm. counting as non-CO2. Yeah. The devil's Everything always in thing. the details. Yeah, well, but still, you know. So I think it's a good start. Mm -hmm. And everyone who's been to China recently knows exactly why this is so important, really. Uh, it's a good start, but then again, executing is the other okay. matter, and we'll see, see how it goes. And there's a lot about, you know, still coal-fired uh, power plants uh, where we can do a lot to help to reduce CO2 emissions. So that brings it back to gas. I mean, gas is so clean, so efficient. You know, gas turbines today, the big ones, have about 61, 62% efficiency. It's huge. And so therefore, there's a lot of technology out there which we know how to do it to help the climate, you know, become a, a, a better shape again. Okay, and I, as we like to have this be participatory before I turn this over to the audience, I have one other question. And this goes back to a previous incarnation. So at, at one point in Siemens, you were the, the global strategy officer that, that looked out and, and looked at the big trends that were coming. What do you see as the next big trend or the next big issue that, that we haven't really recognized yet? Well, since we haven't recognized it, we probably don't know. That's Robin's yet. line. <laughs> Um, um, I mean, the, what we have, what I believe we have not really fully understood yet. What will the, what will, what will the, the growing penetration of digitalization do to, right. to the industrial world? This is not yet clear. We've seen how what it does to the society. If you look at the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters, and the likes, mm -hmm. in terms of communication, <laughs> the question is, what will it do? What will it do to the industrial world? And the, the reason I'm mentioning that is the world is used to territorial legislation. The world is used to tangible things. Mm -hmm. It's easy. If you look at the internet, the digitalization, it's an ex-territorial matter. It's the virtual world. It can be the anywhere yeah. in the world. You know, if you're in Singapore or in anywhere, you can talk to anyone, anywhere, at any time. So all of a sudden, you know, you, you bring the whole matter a notch above geographical boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, how do we deal with it? What exactly does that mean? And that's, that's, a, real, that's a real topic. Because think about information security. Think about uh, technology ownership. Yeah. Um, uh, IPR, intellectual, intellectual property. property. Yep. You know, think about data. Who owns the data? Who is allowed to do stuff with data? And how much? And how about data being stored somewhere? Is it your data about you? Is it your data? Is it my data? Is right. it yours? Is it someone else's? What exactly does that mean? And this definitely will require the world to be step up to, get, to provide the regulation for the industrial framework for such a thing. And I guess that's something which we, which we need to look at and I'd always understand how do we connect from the virtual world to the real world? Right. How does that go? How yeah. does that go? Need rules of the road here. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's because, uh, I mean, electric power will never be, you know, supplied over the internet, but maybe it can be bought over the internet. Right. So how do you deal with that? And, and you know, a million other things. And uh, so, well, this is, I guess, something we need to understand because that's different, way different. We call it paradigm shift. Uh, and that will definitely change the world a lot. Excellent. 
Okay, speaking about reliability, we try to get people in and out on time, especially when we have guests like Joe. Um, so let me do this. Uh, we'll take three questions from the audience, and the simple rules here are identify yourself and your affiliation, wait for the microphone, and then um, to the extent that you can, pose your question in the form of a question, which is always easier to address. And so please, if you've got some ideas here. Okay, we'll take one on the side. One all the way in the back, sir. And then we'll come back here. Hi, uh, Chris Knight with Argus Media. Um, so there are some similarities between EPA's Clean Power Plan and the energy issues in Germany you described. Do you think that the Clean Power Plan would put the country on the wrong track like you described, or did they strike the right balance? Uh, which power plan? Uh, the Clean Power Plan is um, it's the 111D where we, we're phasing out the use of coal. But uh, if you want to just, we'll take that one. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, OK. Leandra Bernstein, RIA Novosti. Uh, I'd like to ask, just with EU and Russian relations so tense right now, uh, how that impacts uh, your, your outlook on uh, the European Union's energy calculus, and then also how your company has been directly affected by these Tier 3 sanctions. Okay, and we had a third question right here. Hi, um, my name is Alex Weidinger. I, uh, I had a question. Um, I, guess I just first wanted to uh, commend you for your interest in and uh, Siemens' um, work in renewable energy. Um, but uh, so my question was, um, if you look at uh, the IEA and the UN and, and uh, the problems they're dealing with now, a lot more attention is being um, put on uh, climate change um, as opposed to problems with nuclear waste. So um, my, uh, my question is why um, uh, is Siemens focusing on um, their renewable uh, programs replacing uh, nuclear programs as opposed to um, forms of energy with uh, much greater uh, negative externalities like uh, coal, oil, and gas? Um, thank you. Okay. Okay. Shall okay. I? Sure. Well, let me maybe start with the last one. I mean, we've got, we talk about energy generation, we have got the full plate of what we can do. We have, uh, we have uh, steam, steam turbines, so we can do, you know, clean coal. We have, uh, we have high efficient gas turbines. We are the world leader uh, on offshore wind, yeah, with far the biggest install base. So th the thing is, we can do everything which is necessary to be doing. But in each and any of those areas, we can help to bring the CO2 emission down. Because if it went our way, we would have loved to have all clean energy, affordable, reliable, and cost-effective. So it'd be perfectly great. But then the world, you know, has, is is in different places. You go Indonesia, which got nothing but coal. So what are they going to do? They're going to, you know, burn the coal to generate electricity and have their society develop and prosper. So it's a very important task to help them, you know, install clean coal power plants rather than have the current CO2 emission standards. Um, so that's why it's not about doing clean energy only, so we can help in each and any of the areas. If a country like the United States still have 40 percent, 4 zero, 40 percent of its energy demand supplied by coal-fired power plants, if that switches to gas, it's a massive reduction of CO2 emission, massive reduction. So we can bring the CO2 emissions down also in conventional energy. So why don't we continue on nuclear? Um, first of all, there is hardly any market uh, in, in the European environment. Secondly, we believe the issue of un, um, unsolved waste treatment is just a moral issue we should not continue be doing. Uh, we, look at, we actually look into how we can help, you know, um, finding solutions that, you know, the, the, the worst nuclear waste, which has 23,000 years to, you know, be safe again, can be reduced to a, to, a, to a small period of time. So we've got everything which we can do on the matter. So it's not that we would uh, only go for oil and gas. You can also oil and gas, you know, do much more efficient in terms of CO2. So if everyone brings down CO2 emission in, in their constituencies, there's going to be a big uh, progress. So then Russia. 
I mean, some of you, if not everyone knows, I was visiting President Putin in February, right after the Crimea issue. It was a big debate why to do it and what. And um, the reason why I did go was because there was a meeting scheduled since November. And I promised to be there. And I went and said, because I wanted to help them industrialize the country. That's the only one thing they would get really out of trouble. We went there and I told him, I said, look, and I'm here because I promised. I'm very concerned about what you folks are doing. Very concerned about it. He was telling me all sorts of stuff, which I think doesn't matter in the context here. And I told him, I said, look, you know, you have friends in the West if you come to terms. But if that doesn't stop, we are going to be the first one to adhere to the sanctions. Very clear, very simple. And since then, Siemens has been in the forefront of uh, you know, helping the global world to stay together uh, in a unified goal to help him come to terms. How is the company affected? It honestly doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. We've seen some slump in orders, as you can imagine. But then, you know, we, we share a common goal. And that's what we do. And that's why it matters. It doesn't matter whether, you know, business is down 20% or 30 uh, we, we do what we believe is right, as everyone else does in, you know, in the, in the Western world. Uh, as simple as that. You know, you can debate whether it was wise to go there and see him. Fine. I, I uh, admit that. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we stick to our commitments, and now it's his turn <laughs> to stick to his commitments. And unless he doesn't do it, then we'll know what to do. It's very simple. This is also a matter of staying clear about what we have agreed upon together in, you know, in, the, in the Western world. Then, you know, companies' interests don't matter anymore. There's a greater good to serve if it comes to that type of environment. How will Europe be affected by that? I mean, that's a concern um, because what you can see is the sentiment in the European economy has been deteriorating massively. And the reason is simple. It is just too close to Europe. You know, it's an hour's 10 minutes flight from uh, Frankfurt or anywhere from Europe. It's because it's so tiny. Anywhere in Europe to, to the Ukraine. And it's, it makes a difference whether you have an hour 10 flight or, or 10 hours flight. And so there is a lot of, uh, of uh, negative impact about the combination between the Middle East and Ukrainian environment. But then we'll get over it. Yeah, and we'll, you know, we need to serve uh, the matter in the interest of the civilized world. That's what we do. So the first one is a bit. So the first one was it's more specific. U.S. focused on, okay. on the clean power rule, All right. um, which is a regulatory proposal that EPA has put out. Uh, it requires the states to reduce emissions and gives them a variety of pathways to do that. Um, might be a little bit down in the weeds for well, look, this, I mean, this discussion. Uh, I can't comment on whether that rule is good or bad or anything else. I believe it's the right thing to do. But then again, it's important to have a combination between affordable, reliable, and sustainable. We've got to find, we've got to find the recipe to make all three of them work. If it's only, if it's only sustainable and doesn't serve the other two purposes, it's just a real problem. It doesn't help the society. If it's only cheap, you know, it pollutes the planet, it doesn't do us any good either. So that's why often we talk about the energy mix. And as I said, if you still have 40% you know, capacity of coal-fired plants to, to develop and, and deliver power, there is a lot we can do. Right. Absolutely. And then again, decentralized energy with wind, onshore wind. Uh, we've been building, you know, among other things, we're building the biggest uh, onshore wind parks here in the United States. We, we, uh, we um, you know, installed two big, two big uh, uh, manufacturing plants for wind energy in, uh, in, uh, in Kansas and in, in, uh, in Iowa. You know, in kind, of, uh, kind of in the middle of nowhere, which created a lot of jobs there. So we'll feel good about what we're doing. So it always depends on the energy mix. On the energy mix. There's peak load, there's base load, but the mix matters. And that's then what you know, we need to go after. Excellent. 
Joe, you've been uh, unbelievably generous with your time, and I want to thank Eric and Camille for facilitating this and making it happen. I, I would just like to say that, um, so my initial impression that you could talk to the detail, but also take the step back and be an industrial statesman, if you would, um, has totally been borne out today and reinforced, and we would invite you back anytime that you want to come through. And if you all join me in thanking Joe, uh,